Hare Krishna, dear devotees, welcome back again to our ongoing series on the glories of our beloved Sri Vrindavan Dham. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Goravani Pacharine Nivishesha Shunyavadi Paschita Deshatarane O glories to Srila Prabhupada and greetings from Sri Vrindavan Dham uh, uh, during this most auspicious month of Karti. So we are continuing with our uh, mini-series on uh, Domardar Leela entitled the, the Binding Rope of Spotless Love and this will be part three. <clears throat> this um, simple process of uh, hearing and chanting as we're doing in this series will no doubtedly one day bring us to the advanced stage of fully surrendering to Krishna. Last night I was listening to a lecture of Sridhar Prabhupada uh, on Srimad Bhagavatam 1.8.22. He was giving it in Los Angeles, April 14, 1973. And he was speaking on that famous verse, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Shmaranam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Bandam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atmanivedanam. And <clears throat> then he summarized it in, in a very nice way. He said, and I quote, Simply by hearing and chanting, remembrance of Krishna will automatically come. Then you'll engage in worshipping Krishna's lotus feet. After that, you'll engage in temple worship, and then naturally, you'll offer prayers. Then you'll engage yourself as a servant. Then you'll become a friend of Krishna. And finally, you'll surrender everything to Krishna. This is the process. So this is what we're doing here today and for the last three years. <clears throat> so, yeah, we're just hearing and chanting, hoping that one day we will finally surrender everything to Krishna, Atmani Vedanam, Atmani Vedanam. So, we concluded in our last lecture, uh, part two, uh, with Madhya Soda finally catching her son, Damodar, who had run away uh, from their home after breaking so many uh, butter pots. You remember Krishna was upset with his mother because she had left him alone after seeing some milk uh, boiling over on the kitchen stove. <clears throat> of course, as we've explained many times in this series, no one is capable of, of capturing what to speak of binding up the Supreme Lord. But Krishna allowed himself to be captured and bound by what? by bhakti, by the love of Madhya Soda. Bhakti is so powerful. And that's actually possible for every devotee. We can all also capture and bind Krishna up with that love that's there very deep within our hearts. Krishna encourages us. In Bhagavad Gita he says, Ananya chetasatatam yomam smarati nityasa tasyaham sulabhala partha Nitya Yuktasya Yogina, famous verse. For one who always remembers me without deviation, I am easy to obtain. I am easy to obtain, O son of Pritha, because of his constant engagement in devotional service. Now our Vaishnav commentator in the series, Sri Harisuri, says at this point Krishna wanted to make this very clear. He writes, Krishna was thinking, quote, if people, especially devotees, do not work for my pleasure and instead become busy simply in acquiring some small material benefit, which they will ultimately lose, I run away and stay far away from them too. However, if they quickly start coming back to me, then I become easily captured by them with every step they take towards me. Thank you, Krishna. Now, Lord Damodar's reaction <clears throat> upon finally, finally being caught was what? To cry. <laughs> he just started crying. And Srila Prabhupada describes this childish phenomena in Krishna book in chapter 9 as follows. He writes, <clears throat> he, Krishna, smeared his hands over his eyes which were anointed with uh, black eye cosmetics. 
The child saw his mother's face while she stood over him, and his eyes became restless from fear. Mother Yasoda could understand that Krishna was unnecessarily afraid, and for his benefit, she wanted to allay his fears. And being the topmost well-wisher of her child, Mother Yasoda thought, if this child is too fearful of me, I don't know what will happen to him. So Mother Yasoda then threw away her stick, because <laughs> that's what Krishna was afraid of. So here are uh, Sri Hari Suri. He gives a very interesting uh, perspective as to why Krishna was crying. He writes, Krishna was thinking, these two eyes of mine are the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon are the founders of the two prestigious family lineages in which I have appeared. They are my ancestors. However, the reputation is now being tarnished in the form of this kajal, spreading everywhere around them. How can I tolerate seeing the reputation being tarnished like this? Thinking in this way, the Supreme Lord rubbed his eyes using his own hands. A very interesting perspective. <clears throat> so at this point, Srila Jiva Goswami, in his uh, Gopal Champu, he describes a uh, humorous conversation that took place at this moment between uh, Mother Yashoda and Damodar. He says that Mother Yashoda asked Krishna questions re regarding this entire incident, you know, of his breaking the pots and stealing the butter and feeding it to the monkeys. And in this question and answer session, Jiva, Jiva Goswami says that although Krishna is the absolute truth, Param Satyam, he's the absolute truth, he wanted to lie to his mother. <laughs> But Jiva Goswami, so, so Jiva Goswami respectfully describes these lies as true lies. I never heard that before. What's a true lie? Well, because although he's lying, at the same time, what he's going to say is true. So Mother Yasoda asked, like this, Mother Yasoda asked, Krishna, who broke the pots? And Krishna replied, it was a punishment given directly by the Supreme Lord. Mother Yasoda, is that so? That who is feeding the monkeys? Krishna, he who has created all the monkeys in the world is also responsible for feeding them all. So all these statements are true lies. In his replies to Mother Yasoda, he didn't admit to being naughty, he denied it, so he was lying. But at the same time, what he said was absolute truth. It was true. Uh, for example, he said, it was a punishment given directly by the Supreme Lord. Okay, it's true. <laughs> and who was feeding the monkeys? He who has created all the monkeys in the world is also responsible for feeding them all. That's him, but he didn't admit it directly. So, now we have a new concept here. Krishna consciousness is so wonderful. There's so many aspects we can study and discover many amazing things. Now we know what is a true lie. And Shihari Suri says that Nadi Krishna often speaks or spoke half truth, half lies. And then he says, nobody should blame him for doing so. And he gives another perspective here. Uh, he says in Srimad Bhagavatam 7, 11, 18, he says that, or the Srimad Bhagavatam 7, 11, 18, says that the livelihood of a Vaishya, meaning a merchant, is described as Satyan Rita Bhayam. Satyan Rita Bhayam. A combination of Satya truth and Anrita. Anrita means falsities, not Amrita, Anrita. <laughs> falsities. A Vaishya's life is full of truth and falsities because he says, or Bhagavatam says, no merchant can make a profit if he speaks the honest truth all the time. You, know, you go to the store and I'm making a special price for you. <laughs> oh yes, thank you so much. So the, the Vaishya has to, you know, lie a little bit to each and every customer so he can make a living. Therefore, uh, speaking half truth, half lies, it's allowed for Vaishyas. And Hari Suri says Krishna was born in a Vaishya family. <laughs> Therefore, he's not at fault for so expertly 
personifying the characteristics of Vaishnas, Vaishyas described in Shastra. Of course, let us remember that all of Krishna's qualities are transcendental. They don't have the inebriates of qualities in the material world. Thus, his lying is not like the, uh, lying in this world. Lying in this world only brings grief. But Krishna's naughty, kali, a playful lying, awakens love for him in the hearts of his devotees who are in the mood of vatsalyaras. Oh, how cute. <laughs> He's always so cute. <laughs> like this. Everything in the spiritual world, everything in Goloka Vrindavan in particular, is an impetus for love for Krishna. Love reigns supreme in Goloka Vrindavan. And Sridhar Prabhupada writes, to confirm this, he writes uh, in his purport to Srimad Bhagavatam 10.835, Krishna presented himself as an innocent child to increase the transcendental ecstasy of maternal affection, vatsalyaras as described in Shastra, Tadana Bhayan Mit Yoktir Vatsalya Rasa Poshika. This means that sometimes a small child speaks lies. For example, he may have stolen something, Prabhupada writes, or eaten something, and yet deny that he has done so. We ordinarily see this in the material world, but in relation to Krishna, it's different. Such activities are meant to endow the devotee with transcendental ecstasy. Now, a non-devotee may have difficulty understanding that, but as one advances in Krishna consciousness and better understands the transcendental nature of the Supreme Lord Krishna and his Vrindavan Leela, it's not only understandable, it's relishable. Sri Vrindavan Dham Ki. So Jiva Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, then continues describing in uh, Gopal Champa that the conversation at this point got a little heated. He says, Aho rajasi chora nam choras tvat prittir gotsrachar ityad yacha kalam nat matta shishuna gavya chorina shishuna gavya korina. Quote, Mother Yasoda chastised Krishna by saying, You indeed are the king of all thieves. So Sri Jiva says that Krishna's ego got hurt. <laughs> so he replied, Maya, don't call me a thief. Thieves may have been born in your family's, your father's family lineage, but not mine. So in this way, Sri Jiva Goswami said, there was this vatsalya ras, this kind of arguing between mom and, and child. So then Mother Yasoda said in a very angry tone, to, to Krishna. Re, re, that's R E R E, re, re, vacho, yukti, satama, chorotama, twam, narotama, jato, pi, varana, monkeys, varana, priyo, varana, prat, ritir, evasvi. Hey, you, <laughs> her son, hey, you, Mr. Expert in giving false arguments, uh, Mr. Greatest of all thieves. Even though you are born in the family of the greatest soul named Nanda, you have befriended the monkeys and you behave exactly like one, you little monkey. <laughs> but Krishna was in, in no mood to back down, according to Gopal Champo. He said, all right then, Maya, I will run away to the forest and live with the monkeys. So at this point, uh, Srila Jiva Goswami says that Mother Yasoda got really concerned. She thought that maybe her foolish child would really try to run away. She, she believed that. So, because she had many duties to attend to, and she couldn't take the risk of you know, leaving Krishna unattended, she decided to tie him up until he cooled down. So, Sridhar Prabhupada describes this as follows in Krishna book chapter 9. Madhya Soda could understand that Krishna was unnecessarily afraid and for his benefit, benefit she wanted to allay his fears. Being the topmost well-wisher of her child, she thought, if the child is too fearful of me, 
I don't know what will happen to him. Then her stick was gone, so in order to punish him, she thought to bind his hand with some ropes. So at this point, as we all know, it's, it's famous, Mother Yasoda started binding Krishna to a grinding mortar. A grinding mortar means, you know, where the ladies would grind spices. Spices. So, I was reading in, in our Goswami literature, they say sometimes the question is raised, why did Mother Yasoda bind him to like a grinding mortar? It's a good question because, you know, we've heard the glories of uh, uh, Nanda Gaon, Nanda Maharaj's palace, there were thousands of beautiful pillars, beautiful pillars in his palace. So there's so many pillars, you know, why tie him to, a, to a, a, a mortar, to a grinding stone? So at this point enters our uh, divine uh, commentator, uh, Shihari Suri. He gives a brilliant answer. He says, this one, Krishna, is directly a thief, and this other one, the grinding mortar, is a direct accompl uh, accomplice, an accomplice of the, of the thief, since he assisted the main thief, Krishna. Thinking in this way, Mother Yasoda tied both thieves to each other. <laughs> Krishna is a thief, okay, but the mortar is implicated because it's an accomplice. <laughs> it's an accomplice because, you know, it's participating in this pastime. So, since this grinding mortar assisted the main thief, well, the two were tied together. Two thieves to each other. Interesting perspective. Now, as we all know, the famous pastime, the pastime of this month of Karti, when Mother Yasoda tried tying Krishna up, there arose a big problem. <clears throat> This problem is, uh, let us say, described in Sriman Bhagavatam, 10913. Quote, He has no antar inside, no bahir outside, no front and no rear. He himself is in front, behind, inside, and outside of everything in the universe. In fact, he is the universe. <laughs> Pretty hard to tie somebody up like that. This is Bhagavatam, 10913. He, has, he who has no antar inside and no bahir outside, no front and no rear, he himself is in front, behind, inside, and outside of everything in the universe. In fact, he is the universe. One philosophical way of describing Bhagavan Krishna. So I found here that Srila Sridhar Swami, he gives a very brilliant commentary. Now it's quite philosophical, so, you know, we have to perk up, you know, like Prabhupada said, sit properly. <laughs> and we're all ears here. It gets a little philosophical, but it's, it's so nice what Sridhar Swami says. He says, An object gets bound when it's surrounded by a rope from all sides. Objects which are limited in size and which have a front and rear can be bound holding a rope on one side of the object and completely circumambulating the rope around the object. And he, he clarifies that by saying an, an, an object which is more uh, pervasive can bind an object which is less pervasive. For example, he says, a big vessel is more pervasive than a small cup, and so a big vessel can easily cover and bind the movement of a small cup. However, the opposite is true in the case of Krishna the rope cannot pervade itself around him because it is he who is pervading the rope from all sides. Krishna pervades the rope from all sides. He himself has bound the rope from all directions. He himself has bound the rope. He's present everywhere. Has bound the rope from all directions. So how can the rope bind him? He says that the rope is nothing but a part of his own, Krishna's, all-pervasive existence. In this way, he is the rope. I told you it's very philosophical, but it's true. <laughs> In this way, he is the rope. 
Thus, for him to be bound by the rope would mean that he has to get bound by his own self. And Srila Sridhar Swami says, this in most cases is impossible. He writes, can a fire get burnt by its own flame? Certainly not. So he concludes, how can the Lord get bound by a part of his own existence? And he said, it is for this reason that the binding did not take place so easily. As we know, it's hard for her to bind him. This is his perspective, his deep perspective, such a wonderful perspective. Siddhar Swami, the original commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam, he concludes, thus the binding did not take place so easily. So then how did it take place? Perfect questions, perfect answers. Well, our acharyas say that although all the above is true, everything I mentioned is true, Madhya Yasoda was completely unaware of Krishna's divine majesty. We were describing his, really his divine majesty. So she was unaware of that because she's in Vatsalyaras. This is the nature of Vrindavan. Krishna can be very personal with his devotees there because he doesn't appear as the Godhood, the Godhead, the Godhead. He appears as a small child, a young boy, and he relates in a very personal way. This mood of uh, Aishvarya Bhav, of the Lord and the Master, God is very great and I am very small, that's proper, but it exists in, uh, in general in the official kingdom of God, Vaikuntha. But there's a special nature to the topmost planet in the spiritual world, Goloka Vrindavan, where Krishna allows his devotees to deal with him in a very pure, loving way because of their pure, loving sentiment within their hearts. So she, <laughs> Madhya Soda, was completely unaware of Krishna's divine majesty. So she, she simply went ahead and attempted to bind him. She wasn't afraid. She didn't have that philosophy. She just had bhakti, just love. So she took a rope to bind him. And because in reality, that divine rope was eventually going uh, to have to somehow bind the all-pervasive Lord, uh, Satyavrata Muni, Satyavrata Muni pays his obeisances to that rope. <laughs> In the final verse of the Domo Darashtakam prayers, which we are now singing every evening, he wrote, Namas te studhamne. Namas te studhamne. Obeisances to that divine rope which bound you. Obeisances to that divine rope which bound you. So, Shukadeva Goswami goes on to describe in Srimad Bhagavatam 10.9.15. When Madhya Soda was trying to bind the offending child, she saw that the binding rope was short by a distance, the width of two fingers. This is the width of two fingers here. Now it's very interesting, Sri Prabhupada, in order to help us understand, he translates two fingers as two inches. <laughs> However, we should know that an inch is a, um, how could you say, a British imperial unit of measurement, which was not present during the time of Krishna. Therefore, when Prabhupada says uh, two inches, it means two finger lengths or, of, of Mother, uh, Mother Yasoda. Like you could take it like this or like this. <laughs> Because Vedic calculations are often approximate. This is giving us an idea. The main thing they're trying to reveal is bhakti. So as many devotees know, initially uh, Mother Yasoda struggled to tie Krishna up with that divine rope. It always fell short by two fingers ah, <laughs> in attempting to bind Krishna. So at this point, our Harisuri gives a brilliant reason why the rope was unable to tie the Lord up. Of course, we're all familiar, I, I believe all familiar. Well, you hear it in uh, part four, um, how, you know, one finger's length was Madhya Soda's desire to, you know, protect her beloved son, so, and the other 
two inches, the other of the two inches of fingers that was missing was Krishna's mercy. But we're not going to discuss that now. That'll be the main subject matter of lecture number four. Listen to the brilliant reason that Hari Suri gives why that rope was unable to bind Krishna, irregardless of you know two inches or two the, the distance of two fingers missing. Why why she couldn't bind him? It's brilliant, but you have to listen carefully. He says, when the Supreme Lord gazes upon anyone with this all-merciful glance, that individual no longer experiences any bandana, bondage in the material world. Therefore, when Mother Yasoda began tying Krishna up with the rope, he glanced upon the rope itself. As soon as he glanced at the rope, the rope itself got liberated. Now, can any liberated person ever bind anyone in this world? Certainly not. Therefore, the rope was unable to perform the function of binding the Lord. So someone would say it's a rope. But bear in mind, remember, that in the spiritual world, everything is personal. Everything is personal and has a, a, a service to do for enhancing the love of Sri Vrindavan Dham. <laughs> so let, let me recite that again. <clears throat> when the Supreme Lord gazes upon anyone with his all-merciful glance, that individual no longer experiences any bandana or bondage in the material world. Therefore, when Mother Yasoda began tying Krishna up with the rope, he glanced upon the rope itself. As soon as he glanced at the rope, the rope itself was liberated. So then Hari Suri concludes, Now how can a liberated person ever bind anyone in this world? That's not the business of a liberated person. He wants to untie people from the bondage of material existence. So he says, how can a liberated person ever bind anyone in the world? Certainly not. Therefore, he concludes, the rope was unable to perform the function of binding Lord Krishna. <laughs> so, so for now, we'll leave Madhya Yasoda and Krishna in this struggle <laughs> for a week until next uh, Friday. And in the meantime, I'll leave you to meditate upon this struggle, let us say, between Krishna's majesty and Mother Yasoda's Vatsalya Rasa with a beautiful verse from a, another commentator on this pastime. His name was Sri Vamsidhara. Yasodhaya samanasti devata kapi bhutale ulu kale yaya bhadho muktido muktim ichati. There is no deity on this earth equal to Mother Yasoda. Bound by her to our mortar, even the great giver of liberation, named Mukunda, prays for his own liberation. <laughs> there is no deity on this earth equal to Mother Yasoda. Bound by her to our mortar, even the great giver of liberation, named Mukunda, prays for his own liberation. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I really like the different perspectives offered by our acharyas in this regard. And um, yeah, we'll continue uh, next week. We're fully into the month of Kartik there in Vrindavan. Actually, we're going out with a party of 500 devotees, eight buses every day to different holy places in Vrindavan. It's just so nectarian. I just wish all of you could be here. But we are um, producing Ananta Vrindavan. Prabhu is producing very beautiful videos, which are up on my YouTube channel. So if you'd like to follow us, either there or on Facebook, you can follow our wanderings throughout uh, Sri Vrindavan Dham during this auspicious month of Karti. So see you next Friday. Shri Shri Gorni Thai Ki, Shri Shri Krishna Balaram Ki, Shri Shri Radha Shama Sundar Ki, Vrindavan Eshwari, Shri Mati Radharani Ki, Mother Yasoda Ki, Lord Dhamadar Ki, Mayapur Dham Ki, Shri Shri Gaur Nitai Ki, Shri Krishna Sankirtan Yajna Ki, Nitai Gaur Premanandi, Jay Jay Sri Sri Radhe Shyam, Glorious to Prabhupada.